Well, Merry Christmas Eve. I am so glad we could get this time. I recognize it's a busy season, and here we are on Christmas Eve, and I don't know, you might be out right now cooking your Christmas goose or um, singing in front of someone's house and demanding figgy pudding, but whatever the case is, I just wanted to take some time and set aside, I wanted to be faithful to our Sunday night, and, and I wanted it to, uh, to well, we'll take that Christmas theme today. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of usurp the songs from this week just to kind of focus on just a quick half hour of being in the word and and just really getting uh, just some perspective as we prepare for the rest of the Christmas season. So pray with me, would you please? And again, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. All right, Father in heaven, by the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us. Let this be perfect time spent. And Lord, may it be that we really nestle in and just get what you have in this time. Captivate us in your word and may it burst open and come alive for us now. And I thank you for the blessing of this time with my friends, with our family. And, and Lord, we've just come to sit at your feet. Bless this time, we pray, and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. I would say tonight as I would any, please never just believe me. Never just assume that it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible always have the final say. Or as I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. There you go. All right, Christmas. According to Statista.com, the average Londoner, by the way, spends roughly 973 pounds on Christmas a year. And that kind of gets less the Welsh and the Scots and such. In our country here, the average in the United States is $975 a person. And that's according to CNN, which is we're all sure of is a bastion of truth in everything. And and Los Angeles, by the way, the average is $2,000 a person spent. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you spend $2,000 on each person, but you as a person spend $2,000. Unless, of course, you move north to the Bay Area like Palo Alto, where the average person spends $3,596. So I would say, choose your friends wisely. Uh, the If I have the statistics right, a quarter of the Angelians, like ourselves, will spend, uh, we're still, to be honest, haven't paid off last year's debt <clears throat> before we get into this one. Now, we have, by the way, uh, thanks to the kindness and giving of people like yourself, and, and we are so thankful for that. But the, the, the bottom line is this. It turns out Christmas was always a pricey season, and even today, we're aware of the fact it's going to cost us. And what I recognize is I'm looking at every person in our story, every character, every hero in our story, it costs them as well. Thank you so much. Oh, guess what I got? I got tea delivered to me. Mm, yes, all right. And I just want to take the first handful of verses from the Gospel of Luke. And I want to be able to have us uh, just look at them through the just look at Christmas through the eyes of Scripture and just let God minister to us. So uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Luke. I have it on Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. All right. Verse 1 And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, and so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now, Augustus, 27 BC to 14 AD, puts this sort of coinciding time with Herod the Great, of course, excuse me, who will die in roughly 4 BC. And so, Obviously, what's happening here is that the emperor of Rome is looking to get everyone back to their place. And by the way, who he's, counting, who he's calling back, by the way, will actually be the, the farmers and the fishermen and so forth so that they can be uh, given proper taxation. And that's really the idea here is that Rome is seeking to count their empire. Now, the person that we have mentioned here beside him is actually interesting chronologically if we're to believe Josephus and Tacitus, who will say that he won't become governor until 6 AD, and that's Quirinius. Quirinius, by the way, was Augustus's grandson's tutor until the time of Herod the Great's 
grandson, Archelaus, getting deposed because he really was a big jerk in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and really, it's believed that when Jesus speaks about a king who comes to receive his kingdom and his, the, the, the locals will not have him, <clears throat> it seems like Jesus is pulling from the relatively current events with the issue of Archelaus because that's very much the way the people responded to him. Nonetheless, once he is deposed in 6 AD, there'll be a revolving door of people, but the guy that's governing in the north in Syria, uh, and that is Quirinius, will then get that property as well, which then seems to be the way that this is looking. So then you get this idea that, that Herod the Great, who dies in 4 BC, and Jesus needs to be born beforehand because Herod's going to flip out on Jesus. We won't see that text, but it is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, by the way. So that just gives us a timestamp of somewhere before 4 BC, Jesus is born. Uh, and then somewhere after 6 AD, this count is going to be made. Uh, and all that tells me is, is God adding Quirinius tells me how long this really took to implement. And, and that's kind of a, that shouldn't surprise any of us. Like any government project, they take time. And here we're looking at 10 to 15 years to really see this really come into, into practice for what it's worth. Uh, the Roman Empire, by the way, they're counting from traditional estimates by the uh, historians of the day. We're looking at 59 to 76 million people that are to count. And this is before Google, where they can drive by and just start putting cameras on everything. So that gives you an idea. So Rome is trying to count 60, 70 or so million people in a very vast empire. And in that, they're saying, all right, everyone, I want you back now. Rome has not required them to go to ancestral homes, just to the home they live in, uh, sailors and farmers and such. But the Jews take it further because if this, there is to be a census and it's going to be counted, well, then they want to be able to put people back at their tribal representations. And thus, Joseph, being of the tribe of uh, Judah, ultimately, by the way, because you can chase the lineage to David, by the way, Joseph and Mary both they can chase the lineage to David. We see that in the genealogies of Luke and in Matthew. That uh, they are heading back then to the area. And what, and what God is doing is he's ordaining through a disruption. He's ordaining this couple to wind up in the place where God wants them, where the Messiah is to be born, by the way. And so imagine there, God has got his uh, scope. They're under surveillance, this righteous man, Joseph, who, by the way, ultimately is from the lineage of David through the cursed line that was cursed in, um, in Jeremiah. But again, this is just his stepfather. And then Mary, who's through the lineage, through um, a different son, by the way. And in that, uh, they're both going to be needing to be, though they're up in Nazareth, about 100 miles away, in a town of roughly 70 to 100, maybe 120 people. Uh, they're going to have to take the trip down. And God's like, no. I need to get them down to Bethlehem for Jesus to be born. Not a problem. Imagine, so he's, imagine that God is using secular people and their lust for money uh, in, in, in this drunk with the power that they have at the moment, assuming that it's an eternal empire, we know better, that in that they're going to try to get people back in to another place. They're going to try to drive them home and then the, the Jewish nation is going to go, well, then you should wind up in Bethlehem completely, uh, you know, being moved by God in his blocking, his divine blocking in this, just so that he can fulfill the prophecies that God has already ordained. So our first Christmas starts with disruption from the norm. Now all of a sudden the government says, hey, you need to go so you can be taxed. So the first Christmas starts with disruption and an upcoming eminent, very obnoxiously large bill. And you know, at least if you're aware of how taxes work, and if you don't, you should really get to get on that. And I just want to point out here that even now as we look at Christmas, and it can seem like a disruption, and it can seem like, oh my goodness, by January, there's going to be very big bills to pay. Well, Mary and Joseph understood that to some degree as well. Disruption from everything they're aware of. And, you know, this bill that's coming for them to pay the taxes. So they go and they head down to, to, from Nazareth, down to Bethlehem, to a place where they're going to be around other people who, by the way, they are related to, but much more distant. 
And so get the idea that there's this first Christmas starts with disruption, an obnoxiously large bill that's eminent, and ultimately a homecoming with a community of people that are more familial, but much more distant. Verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, the house of bread, which is great for great place for the bread of the, of the world, the bread of life, to be born, because he was the house of the house and lineage of David. So Joseph and Mary leave a village of, again, 70, maybe 100, 120 people, to Bethlehem, which is roughly two to 3,000 people people. Now Mary has already traveled at least a hundred miles and we know that because she has gone down to Judea once before and she went for that first three months if you will and visited her um, her relative Elizabeth. Now we don't know where they're at here. Uh, we just know that they're in Bethlehem. We don't know who's you know what we're, we're going to see is nobody's letting them stay. So I have a hard time believing that Elizabeth is not is living in Bethlehem because that would be kind of weird for her not to let them stay there. So Mary's already traveled a hundred miles to Judea before this point, and then that's really roughly from where we are to about the San Diego Zoo. And she visits Elizabeth, visits Lizzie for three months, and then heads back. And now she's taking that trip again down to Judea. Uh, and by the way, this is the beginning of more trips because they're ultimately, as you know, going to have to abscond a thousand miles, roughly 500 one way, down to Egypt uh, when Archelaus, that guy, uh, takes, takes the position uh, of governor, if you will, in, or Tetrarch, in uh, Judea. Which puts Mary, by the way, of a total mileage of roughly about 1,500 miles. And I just kind of think you might want to find that. That, that, will, that won't even get us from here to, to Chicago, by the way. But 1,500 miles is an obnoxious amount of space, especially when you're traveling by foot and donkey. Now, uh, this first Christmas we're looking at uh, starts with a disruption, an obnoxiously large impending bill an old homecoming to distant family, and a lot of traveling. That sounded a lot like your Christmas. Well, he goes there, verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, it's seldom looked at, but I want to point out this specific word here, the word enkus, the word for with child. Ooh, that is a nice tea. All right, and chus literally means, by the way, swollen or swelling. It is in the present active participle tense. Participle means like an ing. In other words, she didn't just come down, she was nine months pregnant, kind of like that turkey thermometer where the thing pops up like the belly button and says, hey, baby's ready to go, let's get this thing out. She is swelling and she is swollen and swelling. That's our present participle in this which tells us that Mary wasn't at full term when they arrived in Bethlehem. We don't know when they arrived. We just know it was after those first three months. So she arrives clearly uh, clearly showing, and she's going to show more each day until this baby is born. So the general rule, by the way, closer to Jerusalem you get, the more conservative, even to this day, the more conservative uh, the people are, the closer you get, by the way, to the, uh, to the coast, the more liberal things become. I find that interesting. Uh, be that Tel Aviv or Haifa, you'll find a great deal of uh, liberal mindset, more of reformed thinking among the uh, Jewish people, Orthodox, which basically means they kind of believe everything to be allegorical, uh, creation, the flood, so forth. Uh, now, Again, the closer you get to Jerusalem, the more conservative things get. And Bethlehem is five miles away. And that will be helpful, by the way, when they have to do the, um, the ultimate, the dedication of the firstborn, which takes place 40 days after birth, by the way. And we'll get there in just a moment. So get this, though. This woman and her fiancé, if you will, I mean, betrothed is more binding than, a, than a, an engagement is today. I mean, you'd have to get rid of divorce to, 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 to absolve it. But for all intended purposes, they are not legally married. And so she shows up pregnant 
with a guy and, and I mean and if he was going to be completely honest he would say she's not you know the child's not even mine could you imagine showing up in a very conservative community very conservative Jewish community and she's let's say in her last trimester swollen and swelling and that just kind of the awkward dynamic of that in this area helps us to understand maybe perhaps a little bit more of six verses six and seven so this first Christmas disruption, obnoxiously large, uh, eminent bill, uh, homecoming with uh, distant family, if you will, a lot of traveling, and then here an expectation to be places, uh, including some that will deal with some very awkward family dynamics. Verse 6. So it was, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Uh, in the idea is simple, literally to, to give birth is the idea. And again, it doesn't say how long they were there. All we know is that it's the past the three months that she spent with Elizabeth and noted it's time for her to be delivered. Verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The term, there was no room, by the way, imperfect infinitive. Active, though. Active means there was conscious choice being made here. And I think that that's important. There's a conscious choice among uh, the innkeeper. Notice the inn, definite article. In other words, versus a lot of inns. In a town of 2,000, 3,000, or you know, much larger than the village that they'd come from, they don't have a hotel row like we do where you pull into a community and you start looking and there's like seven places strewn next to each other and a Denny's and something else sort of nestled in there to try to help with the people who've come to stay. There's a single caravansary and a caravansary just allows people in rooms and then, I mean, it puts people everywhere. It puts them in the hallways. It puts them wherever they can. And I remember us traveling from Turkey to, uh, to Athens via... Patmos and the Greek ferry that we took, everyone seemed to sleep on it. And it was like, you just, everyone just, it looked like Guernica, like a bomb went off and everyone just laying on the ground next to total strangers. Nobody seemed to care. They just sort of held on to their belongings, their valuables, and just waited to dock in the next place, in the next port. And I just think of that when I think of a caravansary. This is a place where total strangers are strewn out everywhere. But I don't want you to miss that this is a conservative Jewish community. And why is that important? Because amongst Jewish culture, it is expected that when strangers come in, that if you are able in any way, you provide housing for the stranger. And it was, I mean, it comes all the way back to a polemic viewing, uh, viewing the lack of hospitality, though it not be the only exclusive problem with Sodom. We can agree on that but that there was this idea of people not being housed or mistreating of strangers. And we see that, of course, what it almost led to the extinction of a whole tribe, that of being of Benjamin, because of the behavior of the lack of taking care of people there and ultimately them acting a lot like Sodom, mind you. All of that to say this, that you would show up, you'd get to the marketplace, and you would hope people would take you in. Nobody's taking them in. And then... The last resort would be to be next to strangers at a caravansary, and there's no room there. They're not even letting them go there. Now, we have no note of a drummer boy in Silent Night, figure out how those work, or a barn, or how long they were staying, wherever. All we know is, or even where they got the cloths to wrap Jesus. All we know is that there's a manger, and that she's giving birth. Now, mangers for what it's worth, traditionally are outside their big stone uh, fixtures where they're carved in so that very large animals could get, it's their feeding troughs for large animals. So you don't put them in the depths of a uh, barn and they're not cute little wooden things because wood was at a premium and has always been in Israel. And so I get the idea, there's this large outside feeding trough that's made of stone that would be there, and this is where Jesus is going to be laid. So, put all of this together with me. You've got this dude and his pregnant girlfriend, fiance thing, in a conservative, in a very conservative Jewish community. 
Who wants to house them? Even with a baby in tow. It's a technically unwed couple with a baby in tow. And I think, could it be that nobody was actually welcoming them in simply because of their position? And you, you know, we might say, well, there are a lot of people that might be able to chase their lineage to David who would wind up in Bethlehem. And that could very well be. But there's still a pregnant couple, and you would think this would be the couple that you would be looking for. There are also, by the way, apparently Galilean here. And that tends to be the sort of uncultured country bumpkin mindset uh, for people who showed up now in a place that's a little bit more cultured and refined. So whatever the case is, you've got a couple that have that are clearly out of towners. They're clearly from much more of a rural setting. And they show up, she's pregnant, they're not married. And, and with that now, they've arrived in Bethlehem. No one's letting them into their houses. There's no room. No one's letting them have any space at the caravansary. And she gives birth. And somewhere she gives birth, could it be outside? And then lays this baby in the manger, in this big stone bed, if you will. So from the first Christmas, it's evident, by the way, that this the child is not, that the world is not lining up to welcome this king. It's rejection time. It's disappointment time. And there is no welcome, no home for this child and no home for those who love him. And still Mary gives birth. And here's where we bring this around. Mary gives birth this painful, grossly messy, beautiful, and profound thing. Uh, speaking, of course, to my wife and others, child, child bearing, rearing, bearing. bearing. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I checked with the expert. <laughs> child bearing is a very it's the, the unprecedented pain, pain greater than we've known that she's known. And I won't go into details, but our daughter is beautiful and profound. That was, and I was there for the whole birth. And grossly messy. It was still painful for the mother more than, more than could be expected. And yet with this unprecedented pain and this mess of blood and water that both the child and the, and the mother share, life has come into the world. And she takes after this unprecedented pool of pain and this gross mess of blood and water that they shared, she takes this gift of life and wraps it in cloth and lays it in a tomb of stone. Now, I don't know how many cloths she has, but sooner or later she's going to have to change those cloths over and over and over again. And I just get the idea that the first Christmas there was a lot of wrapping and laying and I think that's interesting because today there's still lots of wrapping and laying. Our first Christmas. Our first Christmas, there is disruption, an eminent large bill, homecoming to distant family, lots of traveling, expectations of places to be, lots of wrapping and laying. And on one side, we see that an impending bill, people returning to their old homehood haunts to be a part of a community more familial but distant lots of traveling expectation for being places awkward family dynamics and some rejection some disappointment and lots of wrapping and laying and and we could go and say well this is expensive and inconvenient and uncomfortable and exhausting for what but if we miss the gift of life that has come into the world on this day. That's all we'll get to. It's expensive, inconvenient, uncomfortable, and exhausting. But look at it from God's perspective. The first Christmas was God wrapped in flesh, life coming into the world, unwelcome and rejected by the homecoming of locals, his own, mind you, and after a time of unprecedented pain, surrounded by blood and water that he and, sh and he shared with, with humanity, now wrapped in cloth, 
and laid in a bed of stone? And do you see God laying the bookends as he presents to us this gift of life at this very moment? The greatest cost, a father's only son laid before us, wrapped in cloth, laid on a bed of stone, in a bed of stone. And I can't help but think how this points me to the cross, where all of the sin of humanity rests upon the shoulders of our Savior, this same baby from the cradle to the cross, and where unprecedented pain will be experienced. Blood and water will flow. And then, in that pool of pain and mess, he'll be wrapped in cloth and laid in a bed of stone. All because on the other side of that, life will be given. Soon angels will get involved. Common men will come to see and run and tell others. And rulers will do all they can to stop it and fail. And the message, verse 11, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This Christmas, will I remove this gift, this Savior, this Christ the Lord, born to us this day? Will I detach from this the wonder and the wonderful, and I'm just going to bane distances that I travel while a pregnant girl makes her way to Bethlehem, uh, and the God of heaven circumvents all eternity to come and get me? Will I bemoan the forced family dynamics over the cries of a virgin betrothed girl carrying the Son of God, the God, the Son, who will be rejected by those who even claim to be his representatives. Will I forget the great expenses of the gold and frankincense and myrrh that were brought and the greatest expense ever, a father, the Father, our Heavenly Father, giving his only Son, sacrificed for my sin so I could be adopted and made a son of this father. Will I remove my eyes from the sacrifice and pull them simply to the sacrificial? Or will I see the sublimity of this season, the son of God from a pool of pain in blood and water wrapped and swaddled and laying in a bed of stone, the Savior, the Christ, the Lord. <clears throat> On this beautiful Christmas Eve. Oh, beloved, may he lead us back to the profundity of this moment. God the Son, wrapped in flesh from a pool of blood and water and the pain, wrapped in cloth, laid in a bed of stone, and from him, life everlasting. As we go to prayer, can we today see the glory of this moment and that God would lead us to proclaim that life has come into the world and that life came through great expense so that we could become children of God. Will you pray with me please? God in heaven on this beautiful Christmas Eve speak to our hearts and remove from us God the superficial that we would look God at the inconvenience and the expense and the price is paid God first by a couple who didn't even volunteer for this they got drafted in and in that became heroes for history as they watch heaven usher in through a virgin girl the bread of life. And God, for every expense we, we travel, for every inconvenience we seem to endure, for every price we pay in time and in resource, oh God, may they be compared not to the rest of the year where things may seem more of an ease for us, but rather may they be compared to the one who gave the greatest expense, experienced the greatest inconvenience, took upon himself the wages of our own iniquity, who by his stripes we would be healed. And at his resurrection, 
that same stone bed would still have those linen cloths there. And an angel would say, come and see where you lay. Except in this case, he wouldn't be there. And they encountering this risen Savior, the Lord. Common men would go out and speak this message. And kingdoms would try to shut it down and would fail. God, now make us those people who would proclaim the good news of this day. And if there be any who have not accepted this gift of Jesus, oh, tonight receive the greatest gift, the one that came as a threat only to kingdoms and kings, but as a gift to all who would receive him. Do not be like the townsfolk who wouldn't take him in or the innkeeper who wouldn't take him in. Oh, but rather, beloved, let us be those who would visit and kneel at this beautiful cradle knowing it is the precursor to the cross. And if that's you, pray this prayer with me right now. God in heaven, I come to you, a sinner, on my knees, recognizing you brought this gift to me to redeem me from all that separates me from you. You made the move first. You paid the price I owed, and you paid it in Jesus. His death on the cross, just like your word promised, buried in a tomb of stone, wrapped in swaddling cloths, just like your scripture promised, and raised on the third day, just like your scripture promised, so that I could have new life. And I say yes, proclaiming Jesus is my Savior, my Lord, and my ransom. I am yours now. May my life be my Christmas gift to you. I am yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to just spend this half hour with you or so. And I just want to say a very happy and merry Christmas and a very blessed new year to come. If you are near our area, do seek us out as we have some wonderful things planned for New Year's Eve, including a night of worship and communion. We're even praying about broadcasting it. So <clears throat> just the same, now go and be a blessing to others. Proclaim the good news. Our God has come and given us life. Merry Christmas, beloved.